right, welcome back. So, today we're done with lists, and we're gonna move on to the next major data structure that we're talking about in this part of the class, which are trees. So you might think, you know, if you're looking down the road a little bit, you know, 225 talks about trees. 173 talks about trees. 225 also talks about lists. Um, I think 173 probably covers some lists as well. So why are we doing this now? Um, and the reason is we're giving you an introduction to some of these concepts so that there will be reinforcement later. Trust me, if you can implement some of these tree algorithms and some of our list algorithms that you're working on this week in Java, you have a decent shot at being able to get them right in C++, which is a much less forgiving language. A lot of the concepts are very similar. So for example, the list iteration we talked about last time looks very similar in C++. A lot of the tree algorithms we're gonna talk about are gonna look very similar in C++. There are some dangers to using that language that you'll discover when you get to 225, but giving you practice now in Java is a great way to start to understand some of these concepts. So we're done with lists. Today we are gonna talk about a new data structure which is called a tree. So the other thing that trees are going to introduce, this is another moment in the class where the conceptual difficulty, there's gonna be a little bump in the conceptual difficulty because we're gonna start talking about recursion today, which is a new problem solving technique that you guys have not seen yet, but that is a great fit for working with trees. So these are gonna go hand in hand. Recursion is not confined to trees. We can write recursive algorithms that operate on a wide variety of data structures and solve a wide variety of different problems, but they're a great fit for trees, which is why we introduce them together. But first of all, let's talk about what a tree is. So a tree is a new data structure, and up until this point, we've talked about arrays, we've talked about lists. So those are the data structures that we've seen in this class. We've also talked about objects themselves as a way of structuring data. So those are kind of the three things we see. Trees are the first time, so arrays and lists are these linear data structures. They put items in order. Trees are the first time that we're gonna see something that allows us to establish hierarchical relationships among data. So that's one of the things that's new about them. It's kind of exciting. So in computer science, a tree is a widely used data structure that simulates a hierarchical tree structure. So it's also a nice time to talk about trees, given that it's spring and there's trees outside that are doing cool stuff. Um, the trees we're gonna look at in this class are sort of upside down. So at the top, we have something called the root node, and then we have subtrees below it of children. Each child in a tree has a parent. A parent can have multiple children, but if I started a child and I work my way upwards, I'm eventually going to get to a root node. So here's an example of a very small tree. This is a, a single node is a tree, it's a tree with no children. In this case, I have a, um, now we're gonna start talking about our, some of our tree terminology. So we're gonna introduce some new terms that we're gonna use so that we can talk about trees effectively. Every node in a tree can be both a parent and a child or either. So in this case, I have one node at the top, which is a parent. That parent has three children. The reason it's a parent is because it has childs below it it has nodes below it in the tree. For each of those children, it has one parent. So every node in a tree can have zero or more children. If it has one or more children, it's a parent node. It doesn't have to have children. There are nodes in a tree that don't, that we have a special term for that we'll introduce in a minute. But one important thing about a tree data structure is that every node has one and one parent only. Only one parent, except for one node in the tree that's special, that's at the top. Every other node in the tree that's not the root node has a single parent, one parent only. A parent can have multiple children. We'll look at most of the trees we talk about in this class will be a special form that we'll introduce in a minute where we limit the number of children to two, but there's no reason that that needs to be done. In a general tree data structure, a parent can have, you know, zero to n children. So, there's one node in the tree that's special that we refer to as the root. The root is the only node in the tree that has no parent. So we talk about kind of walking up a tree starting from the bottom and moving towards the top. So we can start in any node in the tree and we can follow it to its parent node and then we can follow it to its parent node. And any node in the tree, if we do this, will eventually lead us back to the root node. The only node in the tree 
that has no parent. So again, every node in the tree, save one, has a parent, and the tree data structure we're gonna work with in Java has every node maintain a reference to its parent so that I can walk up the tree. Every node can have multiple children, but every node but one has a parent, one parent. So the top of the tree is a root. I said a minute ago we have a special name for nodes in the tree that have no children. We sometimes call them leaves at the very end. So every tree, you know, has some number of leaf nodes. A tree with only one node in it has both a root and a leaf. Has a node with no parent and has a node with no children. Bigger trees usually find a couple of leaf nodes at the bottom, some number of them. So in this case, I have a tree, this tree has five nodes, has one root, every tree has one root, node with no parent, it has two leaves. So these leaves down here are nodes with no children. Okay, so special terminology for those as well. When we start to talk about trees, we can talk about uh, features of a particular tree, properties of a tree. So for example, we can talk about levels in the tree. A level is a group of nodes that are the same distance away from the root node. So if I start at any one of those nodes and walk up the tree to the root, it takes me the same number of steps to get there. The root is at level zero. If I start at that node and walk up to the root, I'm already there, so it takes me zero steps to get there. These two nodes right here are at level one. If I start at this node and walk upwards to the root, it takes me one step. This node is at level two, it takes me two steps. This node is at level three. It takes me three steps. So I can talk about levels, and I can also, sorry, I can also talk about depth or the height of a tree. The height of a tree is the maximum depth along any path. So there's one part of this tree where I have a node that's a leaf that's at level one, but the height of this tree is three because I have a leaf down here that's at level three. So another way to think about the height or the depth of a tree is it's the maximum depth of any leaf node. So I've got two leaf nodes in this tree. This one has no children. This one has no children. This one has depth one. It's one hop away from the root node. This one has depth three. It's three steps away from the root node. So the depth of this tree is three. All right, so whenever we talk about data structures, particularly when we talk about trees, we need to step back for a minute and talk about why. Why would I structure data this way? Remember, at the point of a data, I mean, data structures on their own, I mean, maybe these look cool, right? Maybe they look pretty, it's sort of interesting to do this, but why? When we use data structures in computer science, there's usually two reasons. One reason that we've mentioned before is that they allow us to implement some type of algorithm on them and that algorithm is more efficient when using that data structure than when done in another way. So data structures as a way to structure data so that we can solve a particular problem efficiently. So for example, if I want to be able to quickly identify the maximum or the minimum item among a group of items, there's a data structure that allows me to do this efficiently. And actually that data structure can be implemented as a, as a kind of a tree. The other reason that we use data structures is because they represent something about the structure of actual real world data. So the data structure is a good fit for the underlying data itself. So let's think about some data in the world that has hierarchical relationships. So we've seen here that one of the features of a tree is that it's creating hierarchies, right? A hierarchy at every level in the tree, I have some nodes above me and I have some nodes below me. Right? So what type of data is a good fit for this? So here's one that we've already talked about in this class, the Java class hierarchy. This is a little bit, you know, insular to talk about this, but this is one type of data in the world that's organized into a tree. So, oops, sorry, I'm giving away the rest of the answers here. So in the Java class hierarchy, the root node is what? Object. And the nodes below it are other Java classes. And the reason why we structure things this way is as we go up the tree, 
we lose capabilities, but we gain generality, right? So if I treat something as an object, then there's a few methods that I can call on any Java object because everything inherits from that object. So in Java, the tree hierarchy allows us to, and allows the Java compiler to represent inheritance relationships. It's used by the Java compiler when doing things like looking up what method to call. So if you try to call the method on a particular class, the Java compiler internally maintains a tree data structure that represents the class hierarchy. And when it looks for that method, it's gonna start at the class that you call the method on, and then it's gonna walk up the tree looking for a method that matches the type signature that you provided. As soon as it finds one, it's gonna use it. So maybe it gets all the way to object. Maybe it stops somewhere on the way. And so this is one way in which this type of data structure is used in the real world. But, you know, again, this is a little, it's like we're using a tree data structure as part of a programming language so that we can implement other tree data structures. So this doesn't seem that useful yet. So here's another example. I know that you guys are these young, budding technologists and computer scientists. And so things are different now than they used to be. One of the things that's different is that I'm not sure you guys are really aware of the fact that there are files on your computer. You know, like, it's not something that you really think about, right? Some of the files you think are on your computer are actually not on your computer. They're like in the cloud somewhere, right? And some of the files you think might be in the cloud are probably actually on your computer, and so this distinction is starting to blur a little bit. But there are these things called files on your computer that maybe you're sort of vaguely aware of uh, that are stored in various places. And the way that your computer organizes these files is into a hierarchical structure. It's called the directory tree. I'll show you an example of this in a minute. That is something that I think is somewhat lost on you at this point. And that's a good thing, because computers are changing and you guys are using search for more stuff and stuff like that. Domain names on the internet. So later in the semester, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the internet as sort of one of the ultimate accomplishments and achievements of computer science and one of the things that is making the stuff that we're learning together incredibly powerful. But the, when you look up domain names on the internet, which is something that your browser does every time you go to a website, those domain names are organized into a hierarchy, into a tree. So these are a couple examples of things in the real world that are done this way. Any data that has hierarchical structure can be put into this, into this type of tree, as long as every node has, at most, one parent. If I start to need multiple parents, then I'm talking about something that's a little bit more complicated. All right, so we talked about the Java class hierarchy, so this is one example of a tree. Here's the little class hierarchy that's generated by uh, these inheritance relationships that I've you know, established in that piece of code to the left. So we know that everything inherits from object. And so essentially, what's happening when I extend pet, every node in a tree has at most one parent. When I extend another class, I'm essentially telling the Java compiler, this is my parent in the tree. So extends pet means that there's a parent relationship now being established between dog and pet. You're telling the compiler, there's this new class called dog and has a parent called pet. You don't establish the root node in Java because it's there for you already, object. And if I don't extend something, that's equivalent to saying I extend object. So if I don't extend another class, Java will put a parent uh, reference in there for me that refers to object. Right, so essentially when you, you know, this, you know, syntax over here is essentially a, a description of how to structure a tree, where extends is, is establishing a parent relationship. All right, so again, files on your computer. So if you guys started poking around under the hood on your computer and started browsing around, what you'd find is that at least on Unix-like systems. Windows is a little bit weird about this, a little bit different. Um, but on Unix-like systems, if you have a Mac or if you log into the EWS machines, what you'll find is that there is a single uh, directory folder on the computer that's called the root directory. It's literally called the root directory. The reason is it's the root of the directory tree. That directory has subdirect can have subdirectories inside of it. It can also have files. Both those files and subdirectories are children. If I have something that's a subdirectory, that subdirectory could have other subdirectories. And what I'm doing here is I'm establishing, again, a tree. So when I stick a file or a directory into a tree, 
into the file system, what I'm essentially doing is I'm, I'm telling the file system the parent of this file is whatever directory it's inside. And that directory itself has a parent, and that directory has a parent all the way up until I get to the root node. Hey guys, can we? Excuse me. Yeah, can we? Thanks. So, again, you guys can, you know, poke around on your own computer or do this, and you can see how this is established, right? And this, again, this is used by your computer when looking for files, right? This is a natural way of organizing things, right, that we set up, you know, as, as part of your computer's files. All right, so let's talk about domain names, right? Again, on the internet, the idea of a tree is also used. So, I don't know how many of you have ever wondered about what's happening when you type a particular string into your browser. What happens when you go to google.com or facebook.com or cs125.cs.illinois.edu? Why do those names have that structure? The reason is, so those dots are actually levels in the tree. That's what they're doing. The dots in a domain name are breaking that domain name up into multiple pieces, each of which identifies a level in a tree, a tree that's used to figure out what actual computer are you trying to contact. So when you go to cs125.cs.illinois.edu, your browser has to translate that into something that's called an IP address for, in order to communicate with that server. We'll talk about this more later. The way this is done is using this hierarchical strategy that breaks the name into multiple pieces. Now what's sort of interesting about this, and actually some of the early internet architects have pointed out that they sort of got this backwards, is that the root is at the right side. So the name becomes less and less specific as you go from left to right. So with cs125.cs.illinois.edu, cs125 is part of a set of names that's managed here on campus. So if I want to set up a new .cs domain name, I go down the hall and I talk to somebody in, you know, the engineering IT office, and they can do that for me. The next level up is this .illinois, or actually it's .cs. So those are managed by somebody else at Illinois. So if I wanted to get like cs125.illinois.edu, I'd have to talk to somebody else at the university, but those are still managed by the university. Now I go up a level, so dot Illinois, where did that come from? Well, there's an organization that manages the dot edu namespace. In order to get a dot edu address, you have to be some type of academic institution. So if I was like, hey, I want cs125.edu, they would probably be like, no, we have rules about this. Now if I want cs125.com, I'm okay, because the rules for those domains are different. And then at the very top here, you guys don't type this into your browser, but all of these, we call these top-level domains, are actually linked together as part of a tree. So there's one organization, it's called ICANN, the Internet Commission on Assigned Names and Numbers, that decides what the last part of domain names can be. So that's why for a while we had the .coms and the .nets and the .edus and the dot, you know, .orgs and now you've got a gazillion more. They just last year released like hundreds and hundreds of new top level domain names. You've got .me, .whatever, there's, there's lots more than there used to be. So here, the tree does two things. First of all, it represents a hierarchical management of this space. So as you go up, you get to you know, start off from someone in an office down the hall from me, if I just want a .cs.illinois.edu name, and I go up to an international commission of people who manage the top level space. So the hierarchy reflects something about how the space is managed. The hierarchy is also used when I look up names. So when I look up .cs125.cs, essentially what happens is your computer talks to the, a, a server that manages this namespace and asks it, hey, do you know something about a .cs125 that's part of .cs.illinois.edu? And it says, oh yeah, I know what site that is, and it sends me the information. So again, this is used both for management, but also during lookup to make the process uh, simpler. All right, so that's what trees are, some of the things that trees are for. Trees get used in a lot of different places, um, but those are some examples of, of you know, what we can do with them. The type of, so trees in computer science are a broad category of data structures. There are many, many different type of trees that you will learn about in the future. 
And in this class, we're gonna focus primarily on a single subtype of tree, which is something that's known as a binary tree. In a binary tree, I take my original notion of a tree and I add a restriction to it, which is that each node can have at most two children. And because each node can have at most two children, now I can talk about them as a right child and a left child, depending on where they are in the picture when I graph the tree. It also makes it a little bit easier to create a tree data structure. So here's an example of my tree node data structure that we're gonna use when we, or something similar to what we're gonna use when we start to implement some things on trees. Every node in the tree has a right and left child. I can also have a parent reference here too if I want to. And then a tree stores information. So sometimes we're interested in structure when we design trees, but usually, like other data structures, like an array, so an array takes data items and adds an index to them, trees take data items as well and organize them into this hierarchical structure. So my tree data uh, class is also gonna have an object reference. That's to the data that I'm storing in the tree. Okay. So. So here's an example of a binary tree. So let me pause and see if anyone has any questions at this point about trees before we continue. All right, this all makes perfect sense, good. So now I wanna show you something. It's interesting, observation that we can make about trees. This is also true about some of the other types of data that structures we've talked about. Because this is gonna start to move us into this next big conceptual challenge that we're gonna be facing for the next week, that you guys are gonna get a lot of practice tangling with on our next MP. So let's look at this binary tree together. And I wanna point out something about it. So I've got a binary tree here, it's rooted at node one. I don't know how many nodes are in this, maybe nine. Whenever I talk about a binary tree, I can talk about, and I started a node, I can talk about subtrees. So node one here has two subtrees attached to it. There's a subtree that's rooted at node three, and there's a subtree that's rooted at node five. And the reason I can do this is because if I take off this part of the tree, it's a tree, right? So imagine I'm just looking at the blue part of this, this slide. That's a tree, right? The fact that the other nodes aren't connected anymore is irrelevant. I went from having a tree with nine nodes in it rooted at node one to having a tree with four nodes in it rooted at node three. And if I take node three's subtrees, node three only has one subtree, so let's look at the subtree rooted at node four. I've got another tree. So again, I went from having one tree with nine nodes to looking into subtree with four nodes, and now I've got a subtree with three nodes. So let's do this again. Let's look at the right and left subtrees of node four. So now I've got a subtree with one node in it, and I've got another subtree with one node in it. So there's two things I want you to notice about this that are gonna motivate our next set of problem-solving strategies that we're gonna talk about in this class. It's really gonna bend your brain a little bit. The first thing is that trees have this self-similar property where if I divide them apart properly, what I get is another tree. So I can take a large tree and I can break it down systematically into smaller and smaller trees. So the second thing I want you to notice is those trees are getting smaller as I go. So I started off with a node with a tree rooted at node one that had nine nodes in it and now I'm down looking at a tree rooted at node eight that has one node in it. And I can continue this with the right subtree of the tree rooted at node one. So now I've got a tree with four nodes. Let's look at its left subtree. Now I've got a tree with two nodes. Let's look at its only subtree. Now I've got a tree with one node. And I climb back up, go back to look at five's right subtree, and I've got, a, again, a tree with only one node. So what I've been able to do through this process is I've been able to take this large data structure, this large tree data structure, and again, systematically break it down into pieces every piece of which is also a tree, but is a smaller tree, so that tree contains less information. So I did this over and over and over again, and what I eventually found when I had to stop was that I had reduced this large tree 
into a set of small trees of size one. So I can take a big problem, or a big data structure in this case, and I can exploit this self-similarity to it to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces until I have a piece of size one. This is a property of this data structure that's called recursion. So we're gonna talk about recursive algorithms, we're gonna implement recursive code in this class, but recursion itself is a bigger concept than just the recursive code that you're gonna write. So if someone, you know, on in an interview asks you what recursion is, and you answer it's a function that calls itself, you've really missed the point, and really missed a lot of the conceptual beauty here to this. This is something that, when you get to 173, you're gonna talk a lot about recursion. 173 is no programming at all. You're never gonna implement a recursive algorithm in 173, but you're gonna talk a lot about recursion because recursion is a property of the world and something that they, you know, computer science borrows from outside. So the broadest possible definition of recursion is when something is defined in a way that references itself. So a thing is defined in terms of itself or of the same type. And if I look at my node in my tree, the tree class that we just started looking at. This is something we're gonna use. We're gonna stick it inside of a tree class. This is gonna be our node class. It's gonna be an inner class as part of the tree class that we start to write algorithms on, similar to what we did with list, where we had an item inside the list. But look, I've got a tree class. It stores a value. I wanna be able to put data into my tree. But the rest of its definition is entirely in terms of other trees. So the, the, a tree contains a data value and then References to two other trees. So this is a recursive data structure. It's a recursive definition of a tree. A tree is something, a binary tree, is something where every node contains some value and then one or more references to other trees. These could be null, in which case if they're both null, I have a leaf. If there's one that's null, I have one subtree, but I don't have the other one. But this is a recursive definition. I can use this tree class to build up very large trees that contain lots of data. But fundamentally, every node in it is defined in terms of itself. So now let's talk about recursion in computer science. So when we talk about how to approach problems recursively, how to design and implement recursive algorithms, what we're really doing is we're, we're approaching a problem in a fundamentally different way than we've solved them in the past. So up to this point, what we've pursued are, what I, you know, what we've pursued is iterative solutions. We've written iterative code. Iterative code goes through items one by one. And this is a great fit for things like arrays and for things like lists. I have a list, I go through items one by one. If I wanna sum all the elements in a list, I create a value that starts at zero and I go through every item in the list or the array and I add to it. That's an iterative solution and it works brilliantly for the type of problems that we've been working on. But there's another way to solve problems. And again, this is an algorithmic approach. This is not an implementation detail. I really wanna stress this because again, I think people think, oh, okay, we're talking about recursion, so now I'm gonna write a function that calls itself. And we are going to do that. And that's gonna like blow your mind a little bit that we can get away with that. But recursion is a bigger idea than this. So a recursive algorithm in computer science is a problem solving strategy where what we do is we break the problem into smaller and smaller pieces until we can't do that anymore. At some point, if I take a problem and I make it smaller and smaller, I'm gonna end up with a piece that's so small that I can't make it any smaller. Then I'm gonna solve it. So once I've broken the problem down into these tiny, tiny pieces, I'm gonna solve each one of those small pieces. And my algorithm is then gonna use those solutions and assemble them together to solve the larger problem. So rather than going one by one by one, I'm going to exploit the similarity between the problem and smaller subproblems that are inside of it. I'm gonna break it into these smaller and smaller problems. Eventually, I'm gonna have to solve those problems, but once I've broken them into really small pieces, the solutions are really easy. And then I'm gonna you know, uh, assemble those solutions into a, a bigger picture. We will see how to do this. So again, up till this point in this class, we've only talked about iterative solutions to problems. And again, that's been a great fit for what we've been doing. But 
one of the reasons we talk about recursion when we talk about trees is that iterative solutions don't work very well on trees. I would encourage you to try this, you know, particularly once we start working on recursive algorithms on Friday. Try to solve it iteratively. It's very, very hard. It's not impossible, but it requires some machinery that you guys really don't understand how to use yet. Whereas a recursive solution to a lot of these problems is extremely elegant. Right, so, you know, I sometimes, I think there's people sometimes that have this misconception that recursion and, and iterative, so recursive and iterative solutions are somehow um, at odds with each other or that there's some problems that I can't solve with a recursive approach that I can solve with an iterative approach. That's not true. Any problem that I solve with a recursive solution, I can solve with an iterative solution. The solution we choose has a lot to do with the problem and what way ends up being more elegant and what makes more sense to you. But there are certain problems where what you're gonna see is that recursion provides a much more elegant, understandable way to approach and solve a problem. So this is a new tool in our toolbox. It's a new strategy that we have available to us. So when I approach a problem iteratively, you're gonna start to be able to see the differences. I repeat this step over and over again, right? I go through an array one item at a time and I kind of keep doing the same thing. Recursion, what I do is at every step of my algorithm, I'm either making the problem smaller in some way or I'm solving the, the small problem. You will learn to see kind of the difference between them. All right, so let's look at this conceptually before we dive in and write a little bit of code. Let's talk about how to count the number of nodes in a tree. Right, so basic feature of a tree, how many nodes does it have? So an iterative solution, and again, this is not easy to do. It's easy for me to show you on a slide, but this would be hard to program. The recursive solution is easier to program. That's one of the reasons why it's a good fit for trees. But I can go through a tree iteratively. I can essentially go, start, I, I have to find some way to visit every node, and that's what's hard about this. And then I just do the same thing I did with an array. I keep a counter. Every time I get to a new node, I increment the counter. So if I had a way to visit all the nodes, um, I could do this. So I could essentially say, okay, I'm starting at node five, then I'm gonna go to node three, then I'm gonna go to node 10, then I'm gonna go to node seven, nine, and one. Every time I visit a node, I increment the counter. I started at zero, when I'm done, I have six. So I've correctly summed the number of nodes in the tree. Or counted, sorry, excuse me, counted the number of nodes in the tree. I can do this. Again. The problem you're gonna run into, it's very, actually very hard to write this loop. Try it. You know, you get me, made me thinking like, ah, oh, this is just a trick, right? I can do this, I've written four loops this entire class. I can write a for loop to do this, try it. I, I, it's, it's not easy. So, how do we approach this problem recursively? Let's talk about a recursive approach. And this is, something that we're gonna practice again on Friday, we're gonna practice again on Monday, we're gonna practice again on Wednesday, and then we're gonna see a couple of times throughout the rest of the semester as well. So this is not the last time we're gonna do this, but here's how we approach this problem. I'm gonna break the problem down. This is a recursive template for solving problems. When I approach a problem recursively, I'm always thinking about how can I break it into smaller pieces. I'm gonna break it down into smaller subproblems. Then I'm gonna solve the smallest subproblem. And that is usually extremely easy. And then I also need some way to combine those solutions from the smaller subproblems together to produce a solution to the larger problem. All right, so let's talk about this on trees. So how do I break this tree into smaller subproblems? And normally when I'm working on a recursive algorithm, the smaller subproblems are a smaller instance of the same problem. So I wanna count all the nodes in the tree rooted at five. Who can identify a smaller subproblem that if I could solve it, would help me solve this problem? What's a smaller subproblem here that you can identify? Yeah. Yeah, so what if I could figure out a way to count the nodes in the right subtree and count the nodes in the left subtree? So if you knew Let's say I told you, I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at three, and I also know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at 10. Then you can solve the problem. And you say, okay, I take the number in three, I add the number in 10, I add one for the root, and I'm done. So I've broken the problem down into smaller pieces. 
But here's the problem. I still have a problem I don't know how to solve. Because I don't know how to count the number of nodes in a tree. Right? So now, it seems like we're not making any progress, but we are, okay? So now, we've reduced this problem, in theory, to counting the number of nodes in three, the, node root, the tree root at three, and counting the number of nodes in the tree root at 10. So let's just focus on the tree root at three for now. How do I break this problem down further? What's the subproblem? David. Yeah, let's count all the nodes in the tree rooted at seven. Three has one subtree. So if I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at seven, then I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at three, because I take that number and I add one to count three. Okay, now, how do I break the problem down further? I'm gonna count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at three. Do I need to break the problem down further? What have I, what have I identified here? The smallest subproblem. What is the count of the number of nodes in a tree with no children? One. I'm done. I have solved a, I have solved a subproblem. Okay, great. I've still got these other problems to solve, but I'm gonna apply the same principle. So remember, I was gonna count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at three, but I'm still working on this other solve problem I created was the tree rooted at 10. Okay, but I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at nine, and I'm gonna count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at one. Happily, these are both single node trees, and so I've identified the smallest subproblem. I know the answer. The answer is one. Okay. Now comes the step of this algorithm where we're gonna combine the results back together. So this is one way to think about recursion a lot of times. You think, particularly on a tree. I recurse down the tree, breaking it into smaller pieces, and then I combine the results as I go back up. So let's go over to my left subtree again. I know how many nodes are in the subtree rooted at node seven because it's a single node tree, so the answer is one. How many nodes, and I know how many are in the subtree rooted at nine, and I know how many are in the subtree rooted at one. Those are my smallest subproblems. So now I'm gonna start combining the results from, small, from solving those problems. So, so when I was over at three, I said, I know what the answer is. The answer is one plus the count of the number of nodes in the subtree rooted at seven. And so I know the answer because I, now I know how many nodes are in the subtree rooted at seven, one. So the number of nodes in the subtree rooted at three is two. Same thing over on the 10 side. 10 said, well, I've got two subtrees, so the count of nodes rooted at this subtree is the count of the number in my left subtree, the count of my number in my right subtree, plus one. So I've got one from the subtree rooted at nine, has one node in it, I've got one from the subtree rooted at one, has one node in it, and I've got node 10. Okay? And so now I'm almost done. Because remember, the first thing I did as I was working my way down and breaking into smaller subproblems was I said that node five, if node five knew how many nodes were in its right subtree and its left subtree, then it could figure out how many nodes were in the tree rooted at itself, because it's the number in my right, the number in my left, plus one. So I'm done. I've solved the problem. Questions about this before we go on, because we're about to implement it together. All right, so. Now we get to the, to, to the fun part, so let's implement this. So just to orient you, this is new code. I know you guys have seen it for the first time, and, but we're gonna use this um, throughout the next few lectures. So this is our binary tree class. Like we did with the list, we have an inner class here that's a node that stores a value. Because it's a binary tree, every node has a right tree and a left subtree. Those can be null. If those are null, it means that I'm a leaf. I have no children. The only node that my binary tree class stores a reference to is the root. So just like a list, I only stored the first item. In a tree, I only store the root. So my binary tree class stores a reference to the root. I have a constructor here that will convert an array of object references into a tree. And it does this by calling a function called add. And now here's where things are 
a little bit interesting. So I just want to show you this piece of code. I don't want you to be confused by this. So our goal here is to build interesting trees. If I write, so for example, I could have add that always adds things to the right subtree. But the problem is what I end up with is not a tree, it's a list. And so what I've provided for you to make these problems more fun is a randomized version of add. This is also, however, our first example of a recursive algorithm. So how does add work? So I say, I'm gonna add a node to this tree, and essentially what I do, I have a version of add that only takes an object reference. That starts at the root. So it calls my overloaded version of add with the root node as the node reference and the same value. So what I do is if current is null, that means that I'm assigning the root node. So the only way this is gonna happen is if the first time add is called, it's gonna be called with a null reference because when I initialize my binary tree, my root reference is null. So in that case, I'm gonna set the root to the new value. Otherwise, I need to find somewhere else to put the new node. So if the root node is occupied, then the node has to go somewhere deeper in the tree. This is how my add algorithm works. However, the first thing it does is it says, if there's space at the current node, so if the current node doesn't have a right child, I add the new node as the right child. If the current node doesn't have a left child, I add the new node as the left child. At that point, so the first three times that this is called, the first time, it's gonna add the node as the root. The second time, it's gonna add the node as the right child. The third time, it's gonna add the node as the left child. At that point, I'm out of space at the root, and so I have to go deeper into the tree. And so what I do here is I use, this is a, a feature of Java, I can get a random Boolean. So this gives me true or false at random. So randomly, I choose to start the algorithm over either on my right child or on my left child. And I call that. So this is weird. This is not something we've done before. This is a function that calls itself. This is a recursive function. So randomly I choose where to put this new node, either on my right or on my left. What this results in is a tree that has some nodes on the right, some nodes on the left. That was our goal. I think we'll come back and explain this again in a little bit, but I just wanted to, to walk you through this before we get started with this recursive implementation of size. I've also got a little function here that prints a tree in a way that's, uh, I think, supposed to indicate what all the items in it are. So in this case, I'm creating a tree of elements. Let's add some additional elements to this guy. Um, so one thing I want you to see is that when I run this multiple times, the order of the elements in the tree changes, and that's because depending on whether random dot next boolean returns true or false, nodes can end up in different places in the tree. The first three nodes are always um, in the same spot. Um, well, actually, the, the way they're printed, it doesn't look this way, but the root node and the root's two children are always the same. Past that, who knows? It depends on what the random number generator returns. Okay. So our job is to implement size. So how are we gonna do this? Let's, let's, let's think about this. So the first thing we wanna be able to do, and this is, this is something that's, so you'll see up here, right? I have a version of add that takes a value, and then all that does is it starts that algorithm on the root node. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna create a private uh, version of add that takes a node as a argument. And what my size, let's have this return zero for now, what my size is gonna do is it's gonna call size on the root node. This is just a little bit of wrapper code that we write just to start our recursive algorithm. So essentially, you ask the tree how many nodes it has in it, and the tree is gonna start a recursive counting algorithm on the root node. That's what I do in on line 36. So now, what I have here is a function called size, and the goal of this function is to compute the number of nodes in this subtree, the subtree that's rooted at the current node that's passed to it. Okay, how do I identify the smallest subproblem? 
go back to our diagram. There was a case where I could solve the problem immediately. When is that? Yeah. Yeah, we get to a leaf. So how do I identify a leaf node in my code? How do I tell the node's a leaf? Bingo. If I don't have a current dot, if, if my current dot write reference is null, and current dot left is equal to null, I should return what? How many nodes are in that subtree? One. Just that node. Okay? All right, so now I've solved, I've solved the smallest subproblem. That's the first thing you do frequently when you're implementing a recursive algorithm. This is sometimes also known as the base case. Again, we will talk more about how to plan out implementations of these algorithms in the days to come. But now what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to write this step where I'm breaking the problem down into smaller pieces. And so let's go all the way up here, okay? Let's go over to node 10, that's interesting. So, what do I do here? So I've solved the case where the node has no children. But most times, the node is gonna have some children. So if it has children, what do I do? I need to break the problem into smaller pieces. How do I do that? So what do I, uh, someone describe what I wanna do, yeah. Yeah, I want to compute the number of nodes in my right subtree and my left subtree. How am I going to implement this? Well, it's, it's sort of interesting. So I already have a function called size that computes the number of nodes in a subtree. So I can do this. I can say size current.left plus size current.right. So what am I doing? I'm essentially saying, I don't know how to solve the problem, but I know how to make it smaller. I know that the number of nodes in the subtree is equal to the number in my right tree plus the number in my left tree. What am I missing here? This is almost correct. Not quite, yeah. I need plus one, I need to count myself. Yeah. All right, good. And we are almost done. There's only one problem here. Can anybody spot it? Only one problem. I can run it, we can see what happens. Let's try this. Oh, that actually worked. There it goes. Okay, it'll work sometimes, not every time. So I have a null pointer exception, why? Yeah. Yeah, so what happens if I don't have a left child? So if I get to line 42, I know I have either a right child or a left child but I don't know, so I can, let, let's try it this way. If I have a right child, then I'm gonna count that child. If I have a left, a right child, I'm gonna count I apologize for using size as both a method and a variable here see if that works or not. Let's try this. Oh. All right, so that seems to work. Let me run it a few more times, make sure it's working in all cases. Okay. I can make this a little bit cleaner. Anyone suggest how? So right now I'm handling null with through these if statements, but I can make this better. Yeah. So if I've walked off the end of the tree, so essentially if I get to a leaf node and I go to its right child, or sorry, if I get to a node that only has one subtree and I try to sum the nodes in the other subtree, the answer is zero. So if I do this, then I can finish this with this very, very elegant solution. 
Let's try it on some other cases here. Let's make sure it handles an empty tree. It does. Let's make sure it handles a smaller tree. Seems to do that. Good. Let's add some other elements to it. Run it a few times to make sure it works. Okay. That's where we're going to stop today. We'll pick up here on Friday. Um, I have office hours today from 1 to 2. There's a reception for someone who's leaving the department at that point. Um, we have midterm preparation office hours starting now in 0403. Um, I will see you guys on Friday, and we will keep talking about recursion and trees.